Jesus' name, amen. So we're continuing our uh, series in James, and we're coming down to the end of the book. Um, I've got two more messages, this one and, and one more in the book of James. But today I am speaking about patience as a virtue. And in the book of James, um, we see in chapter 5 and in chapter 4, um, James actually had a lot to say about the unrighteous, rich oppressors of the poor and how he warned how there would one day be judgment that would be coming down on them. And it appears he was actually referring to the governing authorities of this world who were opposing, taking advantage and impoverishing the people of God. So now, James turns his attention and he tries to lay it out to encourage the poor people who are living under the system of tyranny and persecution of these unrighteous rich. Now, he continues his dialogue in James chapter 5, verses 7 to 11, which is our text this morning. So if you've got your Bibles, you could turn with me there or follow with the overhead. So we're going to start by reading um, verses 7 and 8. We see here that God's people were groaning under the weight of wicked oppression. And James says this, he says, Be patient then, brothers and sisters, until the Lord's coming. See how the farmer waits for the land to yield its valuable crop, patiently waiting for the autumn and spring rains. You too, be patient and stand firm, because the Lord's coming is near. Patience. We've heard the saying, patience is a virtue. Indeed it is. It's easy, it, you know, it, our lives can be filled with so many difficulties, a diversity of trials. And we live in a culture that is largely indifferent to our Christian stand and, and actually actively resistant to what we stand for. And that's becoming more and more commonplace. We've seen it through the years. And although the persecution we face in the Canadian church is minimal compared to some other areas of the world that actually have to hide, and if they're caught and they don't deny Christ, they're executed. There's a growing trend in our society, where we live, of hatred towards those who hold fast to biblical morality and Christian values. In the church's day, when James wrote this letter, they faced similar circumstances, but it was even more significant. And if the historical summaries are accurate, that James who authored the book that we're studying right now, that we're working through, was actually the brother of Jesus, they believe it was. Then according to church history, James, the brother of Jesus, became the lead pastor of the church in Jerusalem sometime after the martyr of Stephen. If you're familiar with the martyr of Stephen in the book of Acts, James became the pastor of the church after this great persecution. The Bible says that after uh, Stephen was martyred, a great persecution came against the church. So James would have presided in leadership over the assembly of believers during a time of sharp persecution against the followers of Christ. And we see that at this time, many people were thrown into jail because of their belief that Jesus was the Messiah. And many more fled Jerusalem for other places in order to keep their family safe. And those that remained in Jerusalem at the time of James' writing, they were familiar with persecution in an extreme way. Many of those who were converted were back blacklisted and disowned by their Jewish families. People like Saul of Tarsus 
were hunting down Christians as though they were serving God and breathing out murderous threats against them. Saul actually was on his way to the city of Damascus in Syria after the the disciples of Christ in Jerusalem were scattered because Christians had fled to Damascus. And Paul was going with the blessing of the religious leaders of Israel at that time, with the blessing of getting these Christians and throwing them in jail. And we know the story if you've read the book of Acts, how Saul of Tarsus was on the road to Damascus and how all of a sudden a bright light shone from heaven and Jesus Christ himself appeared to, Paul, to Saul and spoke to him and said, Saul, Saul, why do you persecute me? And he says, who are you, Lord? I am Jesus, the one that you are persecuting. And immediately Paul was blinded by the light. He was blinded and he had to be led by the hand into Damascus where God had a servant named Ananias who prayed for him and opened Paul's eyes. So Paul, the chief persecutor of the church, one of the chief persecutors of the church, a Pharisee, he now was transformed by an encounter with Jesus Christ and he became one of the church's chief proponents. We know that's because of history. We know this because the Bible that we read, the New Testament that we read, many of the books in the New Testament were written by the Apostle Paul. So this is the backdrop that sets the stage for what James is telling the believers at this point in his letter. When Paul converted to Christianity, he became one of the ones that were targeted. And along with all the other Christians, they were groaning under the weight of this. James was encouraging them as their pastor. He's encouraging them to stand firm, to hold fast in the face of hardship and not to be overwhelmed and also to be patient. The Lord promised that he would come back again. In John 14, 1 to 3, Jesus told the disciples, he said, do not let your hearts be troubled. You believe in God, you believe also in me. My Father's house has many rooms. If that were not so, I would, would I have told you that I'm, sorry, my father's house has many rooms. If that were not so, would I have told you that I'm going there to prepare a place for you? And if I go and prepare a place for you, I will come back and take you to be with me so that you also may be where I am. Wow. It's a glorious promise to the first disciples, but the promise always, all, also carries through to disciples of the modern day as well. So with this in mind, James encouraged the church in Jerusalem not to be discouraged or afraid of the suffering that they were enduring and that they would have to endure, but he emphasized that the second coming of Jesus was very near. James said to them that the time of Jesus' coming was soon. That was over 2,000 years ago. And some people will ask, they'll say, they'll jeer, and they'll say, this was more than 2,000 years ago, Pastor. Isn't that something that disproves the dependability of the Bible? But those who say these things, those who jeer and mock at this, they do not know what the Scripture says. They do not know that, that people were predicted in Scripture, to be saying this, exactly what they're saying. In 2 Peter chapter 3, verses 3-7, to the Apostle Peter tells us in a prediction, and he says, Above all, you must understand that in the last days, scoffers will come scoffing and following their own evil desires. They will say, where is this coming he promised? Ever since our ancestors died, everything goes on as it has since the beginning of creation. But they deliberately forget that long ago, by God's word, the heavens came into being, and the earth was formed out of water and by water. By these waters also the world of that time was deluged and destroyed. By that same word, the present heavens and earth are reserved for fire, being kept for the day of judgment and destruction of the ungodly. God's going to put an end 
to all the wickedness in this world that we see. When will Jesus come back again? Well, nobody knows. We don't know for sure. The Bible predicts that God will show many signs that the day is near. And we can truly say that as we look at the landscape of our world today, the seasons are definitely advancing. The seasons are changing in the world. Our entire planet is getting ready for that day. But the truth is, saints of Christ, nobody knows the day or the hour that the Son of Man will come back. Jesus told his disciples in Matthew chapter 24, 36 to 42, But about that day or hour no one knows, not even the angels in heaven, nor the Son, but only the Father. As it was in the days of Noah, so it will be at the coming of the Son of Man. For in the days before the flood, people were eating and drinking, marrying and giving in marriage, up to the day Noah entered the ark. And then they knew nothing about what would hap- happen until the flood came in and took them all away. This is what, how it will be at the coming of the Son of Man. Two men, will be left in, two men will be in a field. One will be taken and the other will be left. Two women will be grinding with a handmill. One will be taken and the other left. Therefore, keep watch, because you do not know on what day your Lord will come. So, we don't know. We patiently wait for the coming of the Lord. Is anyone here excited about Jesus coming back again? Yeah, we are, aren't we? We know that he has promised that he will. But King David wrote about the eternal nature of God when he said in Psalm 90, verse 4, because we don't think the same way that God thinks. His his thoughts are higher than ours. God is everlasting. David says of the Lord in Psalm 94, a thousand years in your sight are like a day that has just gone by or like a watch in the night. And the Apostle Peter He speaks of the same issue of God fulfilling his promises to his people when the timing is right. See, Peter quotes this Psalm 90, and then he says in 2 Peter 3, 9, The Lord is not slow in keeping his promise, as some understand slowness. Instead, he's patient with you, not wanting anyone to perish, but everyone to come to repentance. So folks, There will have to be endurance and patience on behalf of the saints because God has in mind to save more people. He wants to gather more people into his kingdom. He's not willing that any out there should perish, that all should come to repentance, and has great patience with the wicked behaviors of the people, the the tyrannical leaders of this world. And this is why James uses the illustration of a farmer who had planted a crop in the field. When we think about it, the waiting and the need for endurance we have in the Christian life with the hope of eternal destiny, of a reward that far outweighs all of this, is very much like the waiting that a farmer has for his crops to grow, to ripen, and then produce a harvest. James had just spoken against these rich, ungodly, and tyrannical persecutors of God's people. Now he tells God's people to be patient and endure hardship under their tyranny. The English word we translate, be patient, in Greek, actually describes a certain attitude we are to possess. Be patient. In the Greek, the flavor of it is, having an attitude of self-restraint that does not attempt to get even for wrong that has been done against us. In the whole process, this is where the context of turning the other cheek is. Sometimes it seems like the darkness is deep, doesn't it? It's so deep. The darkness seems to be increasing in depth. And the day of Christ's return seems as though it will never come. But James is encouraging the believers here today to be patient and to wait on the Lord. To be patient, wait on the Lord for his arrival as a farmer patiently waits for the land 
to yield its valuable crop. Wait on the Lord. He will fulfill his promises. What he said will come to pass. The work that he's began in you, he will bring it into completion. Did you know that God is working in you? He's working universally in the church, but the church is the people. That means God is working in you, and he has a plan for your life. He wants to bring you into maturity so that in your life you bear much good fruit, the fruit of righteousness. We all know or have heard, if we've been in the church for a while, what the fruit of the Spirit is. Love, joy, peace, patience, goodness, kindness, gentleness, self-control. All these things are part of what God is developing in us when he allows us to go through the trials and the suffering that we face. God promises that all of the wrongs that are done to his people in this world will be made right one day. And that day is soon. Well, in James's time, he said it's soon. And the God who looks upon the history of mankind is the God that is beyond time. To him, a thousand years are like a day, and a day is like a thousand years. He has a plan, and he will accomplish his purpose in his good time. We're not going to rush it. We're not going to change it. There is a time and a date set by the Father for the Son to come back. And the day is drawing close, my friends, closer than it ever was before. A farmer doesn't give up when his crop does not come to harvest immediately. He keeps working even when the crop cannot be seen at all. He waits with reasonable hope and expectation of a reward of a harvest. In the same way, God's children ought not to give up when they're facing tribulations and trials of many kinds while waiting for Jesus to come. The farmer has to wait a long time. While he's waiting, he continues to work in preparation for the harvest, fertilizing his crop, maintaining his equipment with anticipation of what is to come. He looks to the heavens in prayer, waiting on the weather which is beyond his control to bring the right mix of sunshine and rain into the field to develop the harvest. Of significance, James wrote his letter from the context of someone that was living in Palestine. He was familiar with the typical weathers, the weather patterns of this area, of this region. When he was writing his book, God brought in mind an illustration of something that James was very familiar with. And this is not by accident. God, in his word, I don't know if you've ever noticed, but when he says something in his word, it's multifaceted. And God always has an example, and he doesn't give the examples without deeper, um, deeper meaning. So in the land that James was living in, in Israel, the farmers timed their planting of crops with the seasons. Typically, the early rains came to the land in October or November. And the planting of the grain occurred during this time because it would water those seeds and cause them to sprout and to flourish and to grow roots and to gain strength right off the start. Then things dried up for a period of time as the plants grew under the sun. And the latter season of rain happened in April or May just as the grain was maturing ensuring a maximum health of the crop right before it matured and was ready for harvest. I think there's much wisdom to be gleaned from this illustration, and there's more levels than I'm going to share with you today. But as to the seasons of the growing of the church throughout the ages, the early church received a good watering when, when Christ planted his church. And he promises that he's going to continue to be with his church to the very end of the age. And just as the early church was watered, so mirroring the weather patterns of Israel, so the latter church will receive a good watering before the harvest. 
This is exciting. All the while, God's people were encouraged to take on the mentality of a farmer. Like a farmer, James encourages us to trust God and wait with patience. Despite a changing climate of circumstances and uncertainties. To wait on the Lord. To wait on Him. The farmer waits because he is anticipating this value. He is encouraged to continue the work as he looks at the other farmers farming beside him. He's encouraged and he waits and he waits and he waits. Why? Because he really has no other option, does he? He waits. Worrying about or getting stressed about what he has no control over is pointless. But that being said, he is still aware of the times and the seasons. And even when the crop sprouts and begins to form heads of grain, patience is still needed. Even when you see the crop is almost ready for harvest with farming, there's times when the rain falls and the times when the ground is parched and is dry. There are early rains that cause the seed to germinate and sprout and latter rains to develop the crops to finish them prior to the great harvest. Now, you might ask, what stage of the seasons are we in? Well, I'll tell you something. The Bible, in the last hundred years, has been translated into to more languages in the world than all the centuries before that. The number of, of people groups that have been reached through missionary work in the last hundred years eclipses everything else in history. Is God moving by the power of His Spirit today in His church? You bet. He is moving in power across the face of this planet in unparalleled ways since the time of the early church. It's natural for us to look at things through a Canadian set of lenses, but the church is not trending in sync with what is occurring in our country. For example, in the time of Jesus, there was only an estimated entire global population of 170 million people over the whole planet, 170 million people. Today we have a world population approaching 8 billion or it's around 8 billion. And at this time in history, did you know, it's estimated that there are more than 850 million people who identify as evangelical Christians throughout the world. A particular note Pentecostal and charismatic evangelicals make up approximately 584 million of the 850 million. And according to the Evangelical Fellowship of Canada, the evangelical population in Canada, including all Pentecost, uh, Pentecostal assemblies, evangelical free Mennonite brethren, Baptist conference believers, represent approximately 2 million people across Canada. Let's put that in perspective. That number of 2 million represents only a tiny fraction of the worldwide move of God in the evangelical church. As a matter of fact, those of us who are gathered here this morning in evangelical churches across our community and across our nation represent only 0.03% of all evangelical Christians in the world. Only 0, not even a percent, not even half a percent of born-again Christians in evangelical churches in Canada, only 0.03% of them, uh, uh, of, of, of Canada, represents, is represented in the 850 million. So, the fastest-growing evangelical churches in the world today are in sub-Saharan Africa and Asia. God is moving in power. As a matter of fact, I was just talking to some people, and uh, there's different churches in Asia and Africa that are beginning to send missionaries here. Did you know that? They're beginning to send missionaries here because of the godless culture and the falling away that has been happening. God have mercy on our country. God have mercy on America, too. 
You know, this is all part of it. The distribution of born-again Christians in the world is shifting. At the beginning of the 20th century, it was largely with the countries that were called Christian countries, countries like the United States. But now it's, there's been a global shift. It's been south of the equator where the greatest revivals and the greatest um, conversion rates are occurring. I, I was watching with a, with a friend of mine here this week of the largest gathering of human beings on the face of the planet. Now, if you look that up on Wikipedia, it'll tell you it's some other thing. I don't know why they don't want to say that the greatest evangel or the greatest gathering of people in the history in one place of, in the world was a revival meeting in Nigeria with over three and a half million people at a revival meeting, and they confirmed 1.5 million decisions for Christ on cards. It transformed that nation to being a completely pagan nation to over 50% professing evangelical Christians. The president is a professing Christian. You see, folks, we get in our little world and we think this is all there is to it. I'm telling you right now, God is pouring his spirit out upon this world. He's pouring his spirit out. People are getting saved Iran, the Iranian church, from what I heard, was the, the, the fastest growing church in the world. That was a couple of years, two years ago or three years ago. I read some statistics on that, that they believe that the Ur, Iranian church and the Chinese church is right in there, and they were before that the fastest growing church in the world. Wow. Okay. So, you see, the places where Christianity is flourishing are really places where it's difficult to be a Christian. In Iran, if you want to convert to Christianity, get ready. You are no longer a son of your father or a daughter of your mother. If they find you in places renouncing your ties to Islam, your head is literally on the chopping block. You are on a firing line and you are your life is it? People are giving their hearts to Christ, knowing full well it could cost them everything in this body. That's what's happening. And the church is exploding. In China, I heard a figure, I don't even know what, if the figure's true, or, but I heard over 200 million Christians in, in China, Red China right now. True Christians. And, and these Christians are people that have to take a stand under a tyranny a tyrannical regime. Pastors are being thrown in jail even to this day. There was a bit of a, a lapse in persecution and now it's cranked down again. Churches are going underground. The father of lies. In our nation, the father of lies is trying his utmost to convince people that evangelical Christianity stands for oppression and hatred. It's a lie from the pit of hell. Nothing could be further from the truth. True believers in Christ, by and large, we are standing for true freedom, not oppression, not slavery. True freedom and true love. The teachings of Christ, loving our neighbor as ourself. This is at the core of who we are or we are to be as believers. And, and, but Jesus warned us that this would be the case, right? <laughs> he, said, he said, you're going to be my disciples and I've got a command for you. You're going to be in this world of tyranny, but I've got a command for you. And this is the command of Jesus in John 15, 70 to 21. This is my command. Love each other. Isn't that interesting? Love each other. That's his command. Then he goes into, if the world hates you, keep in mind that it hated me first. In other words, you see the link? Love one another. If the world hates you, keep in mind that it hated me first. If you belong to the world, it would love you as its own. As it is, you do not belong to the world, but I have chosen you out of the world. That is why the world hates you. Remember what I've told you. A servant is not greater 
than his master. If they persecuted me, they will persecute you as well. If they obeyed my teaching, they will obey yours also. They will treat you this way because of my name, for they do not know the one who sent me. You see? It even takes more patient patience to wait patiently when you can see how close the harvest is. Can you just picture it? Like when a farmer first plants his crop, right? It's like, yeah, I know there's going to be some time here. Yeah, it's soon going to be the harvest, yep. But as that grain begins to form heads, and as that grain turns from green and starts to turn that golden color, oh, the farmer starts to get excited. I can't wait. It's hard to be patient. And I'm sure there's many farmers that have, in haste, maybe gone into their crops a little too early where the grain wasn't totally ripe out of lack of patience. Patience. See, we are like farmers. God calls us to patience. Patience is a virtue. So after speaking to the the church about endurance and patience, James suddenly transitions to speaking about something else. And it kind of mirrors what Jesus told his disciples in what I just read here in in John. Uh, It actually mirrors it, kind of reverse order. So James is speaking about having endurance and patience over tyranny and people that are oppressing. And then he suddenly transitions. And out of the blue, he goes in verse 9. Don't grumble against one another. I was looking at this, I'm like, okay, God, why did you put that there? What does having patient endurance have to do with grumbling against one another? Don't grumble against one another, brothers and sisters, or you will be judged. The judge is standing at the door. I think what he was driving at here, James is driving at, that during times of great persecution and distress, there, there is a temptation for us to get frustrated with what's happening. And it's not uncommon for victims of circumstance to actually turn against one another and judge one another as being the cause of or at least being a major contributor to the crisis at hand. Wow. This is an interesting phenomena that is latent within our old sinful nature. It's at times of great pressure. By nature, if we walk in the flesh, we wind up building wrath against each other, and we blame one another of being the cause, or at least a major contributor to what's going on, when in fact, what we should be doing is, during that time, pushing away from the table of the flesh and loving one another Loving the ones that we should be loving most. God, forgive us. Isn't it easy to get sidetracked? I find it. You do too, I'm sure. You're human, right? We're all human here. It's easy for us to get thrown off track on this principle. The ones that we are loving the most, or should be loving the most, we wind up grumbling against. Why is it that we as humans like judging one another so much. The truth is sobering, actually. Sadly, judgment gives us a mechanism for affirming our self-worth. If we step in the flesh and our self-worth comes from here, rather than there, all of a sudden, regardless of my own defects, if I can find someone who is worse than me or expose the fraud of someone who pretends to be better than me, then it elevates my stature in my own mind and in the mind of others around me. This is the source of gossip, isn't it? Human beings by nature like to subconsciously tell themselves that they are not as bad as the other guy next to them. This is the flesh. This is the fallen nature. You know what that is? You know what that is? It's pride. And what, is the Bi- what does the Bible teach about pride? We know that it teaches that pride was the root of the original fall of man in the garden. Pride always comes before a fall. Always. 
And when the servants of the Lord are working together under trying circumstances, there's definitely going to be differences of opinion on what should be done and how it should be done. And all this stuff is going to happen. There's going to be differences of opinion. And during these times, James is inferring that we should not let resentments towards one another build up and thus begin to sin against one another. The judgment seat of Christ is close. It is so close. Look in the mirror. It's close. The judgment seat of Christ is coming upon us at a blistering pace. Whether you live out your days fully and you pass away from natural uh, things or whether today we get killed through some incident, we will stand before the Lord. And every one of us is going to have to give an account to him. Thank you, Jesus, that his blood covers our sins. Thank you, Jesus, that when we stand before him, he looks at us through the lens of the crucified Son of God. But in the meantime, my friends, he desires that we fall in line with his attitude. Why? Because he loves us. He wants us to love him. And he wants us to love one another because by this all men shall know that you are my disciples by the love that you have one for another. Love is the pinnacle of doctrine. It's the pinnacle of it. And I'm not talking about mushy-gushy love that doesn't stand on principle. I'm talking about true love that desires the best for everybody. That desire that is... 1 Corinthians 13 kind of love. Remember that the Greek word for patient, be patient here in this text, I'm going to say it, and I hope I don't say it wrong, because it's Greek. It's Greek to me. Okay. Macrothymosate. Macrothymosate, which describes the attitude of self-restraint that does not try to get even for wrong that is done. Jesus tells us, in his command that believers are to love one another. 1 Corinthians 13, 4 to 7 says, Love is patient. Love is patient. Macrothymosate, patient. Love is kind. It does not envy. It does not boast. It is not proud. It does not dishonor others. It is not self-seeking. It is not easily angered. It keeps no record of wrongs. Love does not delight in evil, but rejoices with the truth. It always protects, always trusts, always hopes, always perseveres. And then it goes on to say, love never fails. You can have all the spiritual gifting in the world. And if you got no love, you're like a resounding gong or a banging cymbal. Folks, we need to take this to heart. It doesn't matter what our talents or our abilities or what we can fathom as far as mysteries or whatever. If we got not love, we have missed the point. James concludes his message here by diverting back to the real issue at hand. When we suffer in this world for the sake of righteousness, We should not lash out against one another in our pain, but instead follow the example of godly people who have gone before, such as the prophets who suffered, such as Job who suffered. Brothers and sisters, in verse 10 of our text, it says, brothers and sisters is an example of patience in the face of suffering. Take the prophets who spoke in the name of the Lord. Look at Jeremiah. He was thrown into a pit for speaking out what was true. In, a, in an old abandoned well, sunk into the mud. Isaiah was sawn in half. And Job, you have heard of Job's perseverance and have seen what the Lord finally brought about. The Lord is full of compassion and mercy. There is a season of trying and a season of trials. That is not going to last forever. So be encouraged, my friends. Be encouraged. Patience is a virtue that God is wanting to work out in his people. He's wanting to work through this to bring us to something. One day all oppression will cease. One day all suffering will cease. Until that day comes, we're called to persevere and endure 
as good soldiers of Jesus Christ. We're to hold fast to our profession of faith and live in such a way that is pleasing to God. Why? Because we love him and we want to please him because he is our daddy. He's our father. He's our Abba. And like the farmer, we are waiting for a spiritual harvest, for souls to be won for Jesus. When our temporary state of mortality, we're waiting for our temporary state of mortality be, to be swallowed up in victory, where we will be given our eternal reward. Imperishable bodies that will never fade, will never die. This is the great hope and the promise of God to his church, to you. When you leave this earthly frame, to be absent in body is to be present with the Lord. Comfort one another with these words. It doesn't matter what kind of trials you're going through, whether it's physical, whether it's emotional, whether it's financial. It doesn't matter. God is with you. He's standing beside you. Cast your cares and your anxieties upon him because he cares for you. We wait for the Lord, for the coming of the king. Like Job and the prophets of old, we wait for him to fulfill his loving purpose. Knowing that he's never going to, he never has and he's never going to cause his children to suffer needlessly. Suffering produces a harvest of righteousness inside of us, inside of the church. That's why there's always revival when the church is persecuted because people don't depend upon their own money anymore. They don't depend upon their own strength anymore or their own intellect anymore. Their dependence is upon God because that is the only thing that they can hold on to. And sometimes God blesses us by allowing us to go into persecution and suffering because he needs to break the pride out of us that causes us to focus on ourselves and say that I am when I am not. He is and always will be Lord of, of the universe and Lord over our hearts as his children. God is with us. And if God is with us, who can stand against us? What can stand against us? It doesn't matter what comes against us. Nothing, nothing, I repeat, nothing can separate you from the love of God that is in, in Christ Jesus. Absolutely nothing. We are going to see the king. We used to sing a song in church when I was a kid. And then we haven't sung it for years. We shall see the king. We shall see the king. We shall see the king when he comes. And it's true, he's coming. He's coming. And we'll see him face to face. And then all this stuff, all the tyranny and darkness and wickedness of mankind and the brokenness of our own frame because of sin will be taken away. And everything will be made new. Amen. Would you pray with me? Jesus, we thank you that you are our king. That you are king of kings and lord of all creation. Thank you, Jesus, for the wonderful saving grace that you give us, Lord. The fact that our sins are not counted against us because, Lord, you know how much we struggle sometimes, Lord, in this world of brokenness. God, we have the world, the flesh, and the devil to contend with, and you know this. And you told us, Lord, that you'd never leave us or forsake us, that you'd be with us to the very end of the age. And we thank you for that promise, O God. So God, would you fill your people with strength, Lord. Fill us with resolve. Help us to be patient as James has called us to be patient when we encounter troubles of many kinds. And we praise you, Lord, and help us, God, to walk in a way that is worthy of the call, in a way that is pleasing to you. In Jesus' name, amen.